a lot of speakers who are going to talk on this topic and to introduce these speakers i would hand over to our moderator dr rajkumar amravati who's a professor and he professor and specialist with a particular interest in hip and knee arthroscopy as well as joint replacement surgery and he operates at st john's hospital in koramangala bangalore india over to you dr rajkumar thank you neeraj for the kind words and uh, i am sure we have all the speakers uh, on board i was told uh, dr ashish will be joining us virtually that is fine and i can see rajesh there and dr kj reddy sir and charul on board now i think rajesh is going to give his first talk and uh, dr rajesh uh, dawrani is uh, going to talk to us on classification picket and alert arco and carbol angle for the next 10 minutes over to you dr rajesh and we are happy to have you on this program thank you thank you thank you sir should i share my screen now is my screen uh, visible yes okay so good evening gentlemen uh, i will talk about the classification of osteonecrosis of femoral head osteonecrosis as we know is the uh, so again this yeah osteonecrosis as we know is the death of femoral head as a result of vascular disruption to the femoral head vascular supply which comes mainly from the lateral epiphyseal vessels which supply the lateral and central thirds of the femoral head while the medial head medial third is supplied by the artery of ligamentum teres so etiology is uh, diverse including intravascular factors extravascular factors but these days uh, we see a lot of cases post covid most probably because of the steroid intake or probably because of the hypercoagulable states that is associated with the covid 19 disease so coming to the classification the classification should have good prognostic value it should help us in uh, uniform reporting of the stage of disease as well as selection of the best possible treatment also in comparison uh, between different uh, comparing comparing the results of different treatment options so most widely used classifications are ficket and alt classification arco staging system and carbol angle so these classifications rely on investigations so uh, we'll look into a uh, bit detail of these investigations the radiographs plain radiographs help in assessing femoral head shape changes but they are not useful for early stages mri is the most sensitive investigation for early detection as well as accurate staging of the disease ct scan is also very useful to assess the extent of involvement of the osteonecrosis bone scan while it's very sensitive but isn't used much for diagnosis and staging because of the more widely acceptance and more widely availability of mris so the changes on the plain radiographs that we see throughout the disease from stage from the early stages to the later are focal osteoporosis osteosclerotic changes cystic changes crescent sign loss of the weight bearing dome partial collapse and finally the secondary osteoarthritic changes the characteristic mri finding of osteonecrosis is a focal lesion focal geographic lesion most probably in the antero superior portion of the femoral head which appears on t1 weighted image as single band like area of low signal intensity and on t2 weighted image appears like a double line sign that is a classical sign of avn which is made up of uh, two concentric low and high signal bands on ct scan we have to look for subchondral lucencies sclerotic areas subchondral fractures and collapse uh now the most widely used classification is ficket alt classification it was the first one to be described for avn and was originally consisted of four stages which was later modified by ficket to incorporate pre clinical and pre radiographic stage since then it has been modified a few times to include mri findings and to exclude invasive diagnostic procedures which were earlier in earlier earlier based on so here is the classification ficket alt classification in stage 0 everything is normal clinical symptoms worsen from stage 1 through stage 4 from mild moderate to severe uh, uh, radiographs are normal in stage 1 and the lesion can only be diagnosed on bone scan or mri radiographic changes start appearance from stage 2 onwards in stage 2a there is sclerosis osteopenia focal osteopenia cystic changes may be there but there is no crescent sign while in stage 2b 
there appears a crescent sign also. And stage three shows gross changes in the shape of femoral head with subchondral fractures, collapse, fragmentation, and necrosis of the femoral head. And final stage four shows full blown osteoarthritic changes in the hip joint along with uh, narrowing of the joint space and uh, vestibular changes as well. So this is a ficket classification. It has its own limitations as it, does, as it doesn't include any measurement of the lesion size or articular surface involvement. There is no prognostic importance has been ascertained to this classification. Also, there was use of invasive diagnostic procedures in the beginning. There is controversy regarding the inclusion of clinic, clinical symptoms in classification because they tend to vary from patient to patient. Also, there is inadequate inter-observer, inter-observer reliabilities. So the next one is ARCO. It was basically an adaptation of another staging system developed in the University of Pennsylvania, which was then modified a few times. So this is ARCO staging. Uh, again, stage zero is everything is normal. Stage one, there's X-ray and CT scan are normal and lesion can only be seen on MRI or bone scan. In stage two, X-ray changes start appearing, but there are no crescent sign. Stage three, there is crescent sign present with or without flattening of the articular surface of the femoral head. And stage four is full-blown osteoarthritis. Now stage one to three were further subclassified based on the location of lesion, whether it's medial, central, or lateral. They were also quantified along according to the percentage of area involved, length of the crescent, and percentage of surface collapse, less than 2 mm, 2 to 4 mm, more than 4 mm. Now, this was ARCO classification, which was further simplified in 2019. And now, thankfully, the stage zero was removed from this. Also, the subclassification according to location and size were removed. And stage three was subdivided into two stages stage 3a and stage 3b. So now, stage 1, X-ray normal, MRI abnormal. Stage 2, where X-ray changes begin appearing, but there is no evidence of subchondral fracture. In stage 3, there is subchondral fracture visible with or without flattening of the femoral of head, femoral head. In stage 3a, there is femoral head depression less than 2 mm, and 3b, femoral head depression more than 2 mm. Stage four remains the same. And the last one is the carbol angle, which was uh, actually proposed to predict the collapse of femoral head. The idea was to quantify the extent of necrosis by measuring the arc of necrotic portion on AP and lateral X-rays. Of course, it was later modified to use MR images instead of X-rays. So now mid-coronal and mid-sagittal MR images were used to quantify the area involved and they were um, and that's how they reach the modified combined carbol angle based on the MRI findings. So this is a study which they, which, which in which there were 37 hips were investigated over five years and the end, end point was collapse of the femoral head. So they, the results of the study were if the combined carbol angle was less than 190 degrees, there was no collapse in any hip. If the degree was, if the, angle was 190 to 40 degrees, 50% of the hips collapsed during the period of five years. And if the angle was more than 240 degrees, all of the hips collapsed eventually in, in five years. So this shows the great prognostic importance of the carbol angle, which can be used to you know, uh, identify the best treatment option and to compare results as well. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, for your uh, wonderful talk. Now, you. uh, questions can be taken now, uh, Charul, or how we want the questions to be discussed in the end. What is the plan? You can take question now, sir. You can take a question now. Okay. Anybody from the panel would uh, want to ask Dr. Rajesh anything about his uh, classification and uh, the current concepts that has been given to us to classify AVN? Anyone? Okay. Um, Dr. Rajesh, um, I understand we have been from time immemorial practicing um, 
to you know classify this avian based on the cricket and hurler even now we still do that um in your clinical practice are you using uh, the arco classification extensively or you are switching from cricket and hurler to arco number 1 Number two, how much importance do you give to the percentage of collapse of the head of the femur when you want to plan your management? So the, the recently we have seen that fecal classification because of the inter observer variation, many MRI scans uh, we we feel it is stage two, but they have been reported as stage three. This is very common these days. So fecal classification is losing uh, its uh, you know. Okay, over a period of time, so we gradually shift over to arco classification, which helps in better planning of the treatment options. And uh, yes, uh, what was your next question, sir? How much importance do you give to the percentage of the head collapse that you see in the new classification? Of course, the percentage class, the percentage that is collapsed. If the if the collapse is more than two or three millimeter, then uh, you you should think of something else rather than regrow no i am giving you a hypothetical question here see classification by picket and alert is stage 2 okay so when okay. we ask the mri guys to give us the percentage of collapse of the head of that particular side where it is right or left they say it is 50% of the head is collapsed sir so now thought... in that management change when you are thinking of doing something based on what the mri has told you or you will still want to stick to your picket and alert and say it is stage 2 and i'll go with what i'm supposed to do okay so what you are asking sir is not the collapse you are asking about the area of involvement because in stage 2 there is no collapse Correct. in stage 2 picket alt uh, classification there is no collapse of the femoral head there is geographical lesion is present on the mri so if the area yeah. of involvement if the area of involvement on uh, a geographic uh, lesion in state if uh, on the mri is less than 50% mm. then we should plan to preserve the hip that's what i do so it's not collapse it's the area of involvement basically if there is collapse it is already stage 3 or more yes so it, we are supposed to probably ask uh, the interpretation to the radiologist to give us percentage of the involvement of the head in yes. addition to the stage that they give would be the message probably that should go across the uh, panel here and to the viewers yes uh, do you agree dr reddy and others on the yeah, panel yeah i think i think rajesh that was a wonderful presentation about classification because classification is always difficult especially with the uh, MRI, there is always debate between us and uh, the radiologists. Yes. Um, I just wanted to know: Do you classify yourself? You read your MRI scans. You take what the radiologist reports. So both are important. I mean, uh, you can never be overconfident. Uh, uh, you you must see yourself. The I I I see myself the MRI scans. I also sometimes, if I'm in doubt, I also ask them to repeat a CT scan also. to compare mri and ct scan and of course you have to read their reports as well absolutely i think uh, probably it is important that we discuss with them and yes. we know what exactly we want because if uh, if they realize the treatment uh, is different for different stages we have to know we have to ask them exactly if it's 50% or more more or less i think some of the uh, what are the indications are clear to some extent so it's better always to discuss with them because uh, sometimes for me difficult to read mri scan so i go them they show us then we understand better thank you dr thank you. rajesh thank you uh, for your presentation and now i call upon the second speaker of this evening dr k j reddy sir who is a senior orthopedic surgeon from hyderabad to give his talk on location of avian uh, region and how he selects his cases for osgro Yeah, thank you, Doctor Kajeri, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Rajkumar. That's all. Nice to see you again. Thank you. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, Regrow com- Company uh, for uh, organizing the excellent meeting because um, day by day these cases are increasing. And one thing I think most of the um, uh, audience knows that uh, the amount of um, 
necrosis is most of the time fixed. I think they should understand that at the time of insult to the head, it's very unlikely to progress. And in the sense, in the volume of the head, the amount of the head do not progress over a period of time, but the changes will progress. So it is important to assess the amount of the head which is involved to decide the um, treatment options. So I'm going to talk some of the principle of mainly practical ways. So when you wait before you do any surgical intervention, what kind of cases? And when do you do surgical procedures? And when not to do some of the surgical procedures? These are the important things as you grow up in a surgical uh, uh, career. These are the things you should learn. And as I think Rajesh has gone through um, in detail um, about the classification and about the diagnosis, is important. Clean X-ray sometimes gives more information than MRI. So you should keep clean X-ray all the time. And that's useful for uh, comparison as well because postoperatively, you only see X-rays because if you do MRI scan immediate post-op or few months, uh, uh, within few months or years, uh, there will be confusing because there will be activity and still it will be considered as avian. Radiologists uh, report as avian only. So you have to be very uh, important that uh, you take x-rays and you must be able to read um, x-rays and keep good quality x-rays. And MRI is, as, as, as Rajesh said, is a very sensitive and a very specific um, because it is important to know the amount of the head is involved. If it is a significant amount, more than 50%, um, we won't be able to offer um, autologous uh, um, osteoblast transplantation. So it is important to know what is the amount of uh, head is involved. So the size of the necrotic lesion is important and as well as its uh, location of the lesion, especially in relation to the weight-bearing part. And most of the treatments are based on this and their outcomes also based on the size of the location as well as the um, lo uh, size as well as location of the lesion. It can be medial lesion or a central lesion or a lateral lesion. And important to know that any lesion very close to the subcondral bone is very important because it's likely to collapse. If you do any procedure, then if you're too close to the subchondral bone, it will collapse and progress to further stage. So it's very, very important. You must be very cautious with these lesions which are very close to subchondral bone because they're likely to collapse. And lesions away from subchondral bone, they're good to treat with the um, os grow because they have better results. And we have observed, I mean, so recently increased incidence. See, every day, probably I see two, three cases of avian, may, mainly post-COVID, combination of COVID and the steroids. And the lesions are quite significant. Previously, idiopathic one, I mean, so we generally say idiopathic one will have a good prognosis because the lesions are not so big and progression may not be as bad as uh, steroid-induced or alcohol-induced. But COVID-induced um, uh, lesions or avian, which is combination of COVID as well as steroids, probably have bad prognosis, and the lesions are quite big. And of course, this uh, uh, mention of steroid classification, which uh, will say the um, involvement of the articular cartilage, that is important. I don't go into details, but this is one uh, useful information from a Japanese uh, recent uh, classification. You can go through that also um, in relation to the weight-bearing portion, which is important when you are uh, uh, treating with OSCRO. And of course, most of the time, we follow carbal angle, uh, which is a modified carbal angle, which is based on MRI. And as uh, um, Rajesh rightly said, if it is... Uh, uh, initial stages, probably uh, those in uh, stage one probably may not progress 
so those people can be treated non intervention they can be observed they can be treated without any surgical intervention maybe symptomatic and especially they are asymptomatic you don't have to do anything um, else because the results are um, equally good i mean results are good after 5 years as rajesh said uh, if there uh, if it is a less angle and asymptomatic you can leave them alone well alone so it is important for you to know when not to treat them and of course as i said it is also important for the treatment purpose quantification generally we say if it is minimal less than 15% and asymptomatic again we can leave them well alone probably um, they they do well because what we are worried is collapse and what we are trying to do is prevention of the collapse of the head so that the osteoarthritic changes will be prevented um so in um, less than 15% asymptomatic patients you don't have to do any intervention if between moderate between 15 to up to 50% of the head is involved uh, probably you can uh, treat them with osteo and they have good results in more than 50% um initial stages i think when we did not understand about 4 5 years ago when we started with osteo probably i also treated with the people of beyond the um in more more than 50% and the results are very bad yesterday only i once saw i saw one patient which was stage 2 other side was maybe stage 2 b beyond that um it collapsed completely the other side which was beyond stage 2 b more than 50% head was small whereas the stage 2 which was less than 50% i mean a remarkable recovery and you one more thing for youngsters i think transient bone marrow syndrome we should be aware it can mimic and you should know what how to treat these conditions so in general subchondral bone plays very important role in um, in, in management and subchondral collapse if it is more than 2 mm you should not do osteo because they're going to collapse and it will progress further site is also important if it is very close to subchondral bone probably you have to think about other option or when you are treating with the osteo you should be very careful not to drill very close to the lesion and you also you should be very careful treating weight bearing portion of the osteonecrosis involving weight bearing weight bearing portion of the neck this is uh, one of the um, cases i just want to show because x rays are very very important for later uh, um, um comparison as you can see is a um, young patient bilateral avian um mri scan shows stage 2 and treat uh, this is pre op x ray this is post op as you can see this one is uh, 17 december this is immediate post op in uh, august 21 uh, not immediate post op probably op after one year and this is uh, In December 21, and this is uh, in May. Recently, a couple of days ago, I saw. And this, uh, I think, uh, as you can see, the radiological changes. What I keep saying to the people that most important thing is you should see any progress of the disease. You can see there is no progress, and probably um, here in the um, the last X-ray, maybe there is some bone formation, but uh, the congruent congruency of the head is well preserved um there's a lot of debate when to do mri scan if you do within 2 years or 3 years there will be still lesions so you won't be able to compare um the the results outcomes of uh, uh, the treatment with osteo so i think the best way is to keep x rays and see what uh, would be the uh, the progression and most of the time the collapse or flattening of the head is the is the key that uh, you're probably going to progress if that's not there i think uh, you're quite safe oh a lot of rich literature review i think this recent one i korean literature um so so many treatment options they've described but none of the options were uh, um very successful so there is a good feature for uh, osteo 
because if we we have I have done more than 200 cases now. Charul was saying the other day, probably we can publish and come out with the results. What are suitable cases and which are the ideal cases for uh, uh, to get good results? And uh, I think, in my opinion, patients with uh, less than 50 percent, um, with uh, I mean, of course, symptomatic stage two, uh, without significant involvement of the subcondral bone or minimal, maybe one to two millimeter subcondral collapse would be ideal for hospital treatment. Thank you very much for uh, uh, listening. I think this uh, I was uh, saying about uh, pre-collapse case is uh, ideal. Subcondral bone uh, should not be any collapse, less than two millimeters. If, if it is, as I said, if the small angle painful, if it is not painful, then probably you can leave them well alone. And weight bearing area, if there is a subchondral um, significant involvement, probably it may not be an ideal case. Thank you very much for your patience with me. Thank you, Dr. KJ Reddy, sir. And uh, now the paper is open for discussion. I see Dr. Palikar, sir, has joined us. Good evening, sir. Uh, Hi, Dr. Sorry. Palikar. Sir, you are muted. Yeah. Thank you so much and sorry that I joined late because I'm leaving on vacation tomorrow. So a lot of last uh, minute work <laughs> pending. But I uh, yeah, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, sir. Sir, your thoughts on uh, Dr. Reddy's presentation, sir? Uh, it, excellent, actually, sir. I think uh, Reddy, sir, covered almost everything. And uh, my views are almost the same and that the case that uh, he showed, uh, I have seen so many of these results where the choice of uh, cases is very important. And uh, like Dr. Reddy sir mentions, and now ARCO has also confirmed uh, that we really do not require an MRI to see the progression of the lesion. Uh, what we require is an X-ray where we look for the X-ray is the best investigation to see for subchondral collapse. And the, the progression should be seen as maintaining the sphericity of the femoral head. As long as the sphericity of the femoral head is, uh, is retained, the patient will have an excellent result. And I usually use the HARICIP score uh, for this. And uh, HARICIP score in these patients is typically uh, 90, 92, 95. Uh, which is actually equivalent to a extremely well-functioning total hip replacement. So I think that uh, we are onto a great thing here, where uh, we can uh, we can definitely offer head preserving options to younger people who are not really good candidate for a total hip replacement. So just a thought uh, that I wanted to discuss on this forum. Yes, sir. There was this young gentleman who presented like uh, what uh, Dr. Reddy sir was showing, kind of a transient change in the marrow of the femur, right. which was reported as um, linear stress fracture yeah. in the femur and uh, query avian. Right. And uh, now, if you are looking at the head that was there, probably it would be probably grade 2, not moving on to grade 3 avian. Uh, but they had put a query though this gentleman is shopping all over uh, the place and then finally landed up with us. And finally, we had to take a second opinion, reconfirm the diagnosis, which was not avian, but just a linear stress fracture. Yes. And then we had to manage him with only medication that was required and is pain-free uh, for that uh, matter. But how often do we see that uh, these kind of reporting, you know, takes us to a uh, wrong direction, number one. Number two, the location of avian that sir was mentioning is very critical. And I remember discussing in Goa forum where you showed where the avian was uh, only medial. And then you said we can uh, go ahead and do only conservative way of management rather than yeah. um, doing anything active. Correct, sir. So your thoughts on that, sir? Uh, if I if I'm not wrong, sir, I think I have also seen this patient. Like you said, the patient was shopping around, and I think he was a resident or someone, uh, a doctor or someone like that. 
is that the same patient sir uh, no sir he was little elderly uh, okay maybe in his 45 40 40 45 range yeah so this guy uh, this doctor was also uh, i think he was an orthopedic surgeon and i explained to him that this is definitely not avian and he showed me uh, two or three mris and poor guy was confused he used to keep on getting mris done from multiple places but eventually it was just rest was uh, the solution it was not avian one more thing i would like to uh, point out sir that i uh, some time back i uh, received again a web consultation and this uh, young chap had developed hip pain now this is one of the very uh, rare instances where i have seen a hyper acute stage of avian where uh, we don't it has not been described also on uh, uh, you know in literature but this was a hyper acute stage where it was very difficult to make out that uh, with that it was avian uh, because there were a lot of t2 signals however the classical band of avian was absent so what i asked him to do was i asked him to wait for a month and repeat the mri because it was definitely the the mri was not suggestive of avian at the first time and after a month when he repeated the mri there were the classical signals of avian so it takes some time for because of the availability of technology uh, there are chances that we may get more and more of these patients but that the classical definition of avian the double intensity sign that we see with convexity away from the joint you know uh, is one of the classical signs of avian and unless as we uh, learn to differentiate that uh, it is we will be treating a lot of cases which do not require treatment yeah i think uh, i agree with you gorish recently one of our neurosurgeon developed and he i mean as you know doctors were very bad patients they he went around and uh, oh, I mean, so many opinions. If we see ten doctors, there will be eleven opinions. And finally, settled with me. I, I told him it's. I think it's a uh, not avian because I did not uh, fit into those. Uh, um, you rightly said radiological symptoms, and uh, we already had four MRI scans. And if you carefully see, I think probably it was coming down. A good rest, good anti-inflammatory um, medication. Um, I think. Uh, it uh, settled but it took about 6 to 9 months sometimes it takes longer and you had to i think uh, very careful because um, sometimes you can be mistaken and uh, do something else probably most of these patients uh, um, do well but we don't see very often maybe once in a while maybe once in 6 months once in a year dr rajesh your thoughts on uh, dr reddy's uh, presentation unmute yourself rajesh well i recently had two doctors who had avian one was a medicine guy and the other was an ophthalmologist but both of them had avian characteristic changes avian and we used uh, osgro and uh, they are having very good results so one lady had a stress fracture as a linear stress fracture but that was very rightly mentioned on the mri so i haven't had that that an experience with mri takes in the absolute wrong direction that's it okay thank you dr reddy and thank you uh, thank you for all the panelists and now i call upon dr uh, palikar sir to tell us when not to do osgro that is the key for all of us to know uh, how to choose our patients and who are the right patients for osgro over to you dr palikar sir thank you sir thank you uh, thank you dr amravati i'll just uh... share my screen uh, can you see my screen uh, not yet sir yes sir yeah uh, so i feel that uh, for a technology or a procedure which is very new uh, we need to uh, understand when not to operate equally well as when we need to operate so this is uh, has been my experience uh, about when not to operate on uh, people with uh, this kind of uh, 
with Osgro cells. So first is whenever the diagnosis is in doubt, like uh, Rajkumar sir mentioned right now, that uh, sometimes the diagnosis it can itself can be in doubt. So we have various uh, things like bone marrow edema syndrome or transient osteoporosis of the hip or a subchondral insufficiency fracture. When the disease severity is either too little or there is a too much of disease. And there are associated diseases which prevent a successful outcome of the disease. So these are the conditions where I feel that uh, we are setting up the patient for either a wrong surgery or we are setting up the patient for failure. So things which mimic AVN are basically a bone marrow edema syndrome and also called as transient osteoporosis of the hip. And second is a subchondral insufficiency fracture of the femoral head. Now, these are both uh, relatively rare disease, but uh, they can be mistaken for osteonecrosis. They have very distinctive clinical and radiological pictures and which will help us differentiate them from osteonecrosis. Now, bone marrow edema syndrome or transient osteoporosis hip is classically a patient where the patient comes with a very severe limp and pain. And the symptoms are completely disproportionate uh, to the clinical picture. So your x-ray will be absolutely normal. Uh, the patient will be severely limping or in severe pain. It is characterized by an absolutely normal range of motion of the hip. So there is very rarely even a synovitis to prevent a terminal uh, restriction of hip range of motion. Uh, it is always uh, unilateral. Somehow it is more common in middle-aged people around the 35 age group or so, or in females during pregnancy. Now what we see in this region is I will just go take you to a picture. Now as you can see on T2 images now, that the whole proximal femur right up to the trochanter is lit up uh, like almost there is a Diwali going on there. And in second thing is that in the subchondral region here, there is a I think Dr. Gorish's network went off. Yes, if you can help uh, reconnect with Dr. Gaurash, it will be nice. Me call him. Yeah, I'll call him. Gaurash, sir, is back. muted. Yeah. yeah, he's back. One minute, I'm... Um... Yeah, he's back. Yes, go ahead, share your screen again. Yeah, yeah. I think I lost the connectivity. Yeah. Yeah. So you are speaking about bone marrow edema. Yes. So as you can one second. So as you can see, there is the proximal end of the femur is completely lit up on T2, and there is a thin band of dark here as well as here. It, there is a thin band of dark uh, ye. This is very characteristic of transient idiopathic osteoporosis. Now, like I was saying, I have suffered from it myself. For the first hip, when it involved me, I took a lot of care. But for the second hip, I did not do anything and I just recovered fine. So no calcium, no rest, no vitamin D, and still it, it becomes okay. It just I remember, it reminded me that I have become a middle-aged person. That's all that it did for me. Uh, second thing that uh, is very common is the subchondral insufficiency fracture of the femoral head or SIF. This is typically seen in elderly people uh, where you get a subchondral discontinuous radiolicent line which is parallel to the articular surface in both a T2 as well as T1 images. DEXA scan would reveal that very low T scores. And as you can see here, the AVN, the, the low intensity sign is 
convex away from the joint while in sif it is concave towards the joint or it is parallel to the joint this is typically uh, known as sif so these are the two things again sif uh, as uh, disease it can go either way and here i want to show you a case uh, of a 80 year old female who developed hip pain no history of any steroid trauma or anything the pain subsided she was investigated by a spine mri which did not reveal anything significant dexa revealed severe osteoporosis and this is her mri report after 6 months as you can see that there is a subcontral line which is parallel and it is almost following the uh, joint surface the x ray revealed this picture and a reduction in the joint space there is a change in contour of the femoral head and this basically required at that stage she was 80 years old so i did a bipolar on her second thing is that if the severity of the disease is very high so i feel that once the contour of the head is lost uh, the patient needs to undergo a hip replacement as it is a very good salvage procedure for such a hip Uh, if there is a more than 2 mm collapse that is if the patient is in arco 2b again the fate of the joint is sealed however if the patient is in arco 2a i have got a sufficiently large follow up which shows that less than 2 mm collapse is compatible with a fairly good uh, joint function so that the patient is able to carry on for 8 10 years easily without him requiring a hip replacement the advantage of this procedure being that the patient can do the normal functions that uh, a person wants to do like sit on the ground do trekking and most of the active things they are able to do other thing is that avian associated with renal transplants is very common because of steroid however the patient is always going to be on cytotoxic drugs and this is detrimental to the cells that we are injecting i have tried it in one case but it has not worked in severe sickling disease where unless the patient is ready for a bone marrow transplant uh, there are very high chances of the patient developing recurrent avian because of the nature of the disease also whenever there is a severe restriction of the range of motion of the hip and when you watch the mri and there is not much synovitis uh, then it is a case of arthrofibrosis and even if we manage to um, uh, you know maintain the sphericity of the femoral head the patient is not going to benefit from this treatment now i will just show you a few mris where which will help you identify when we are not supposed to do this as you can see there is a very thin line under the subchondral area this is typically found when there is a fluid into the subchondral area and this would this is a picture of a patient that i did a total hip replacement and as you can see that there is a severe delamination of the of the cartilage and this would not work in this patient again there is a too much of a disease where here the whole femoral head is involved there is more than 90% involvement of the femoral head there is nothing remaining or there is no chance or vascularity of the femoral head in such cases i think again uh, total hip replacement is the better alternative this is the patient with again nearly complete femoral head involvement where uh, i have done uh, a dual mobility hip the patient was around 45 46 years of age and this is the picture of the patient again uh the lesions which are very close to the articular cartilage now i feel that subchondral bone is nearly like a end organ because whatever changes have happened in the subchondral bone uh, over a, a lifetime of the patient 20 years 30 years they are difficult to replicate again uh, so we should not be curating out in the subchondral zone if we curate out in the subchondral zone we are basically Uh, uh priming the patient for a early collapse so whenever there is such a lesion where the lesion is less than 1 cm from the subchondral zone as you can see on the x ray also and uh, on the mri also i feel that these patients will 
should uh, be observed and we should not accelerate the the collapse of the head by drilling into the subchondral region where we will uh, i feel that we will uh, precipitate early collapse this is what dr rajkumar was uh, talking about that this is a patient which i have followed now for almost 3 years and she keeps on coming to me every year uh, with a fresh mri and here you can see that it's absolutely a medial lesion though it is a significantly large medial lesion uh, and i think the on the mri the lesion is more than 30% uh, you can see that over the 3 years the patient has not developed fresh symptoms but it is just that she is afraid that one day it will collapse and it will involve uh, the lateral pillar and that's the reason why she keeps on getting these mris but i don't think this will progress further relative contraindications of this procedure are patients who are on low dose steroids uh, for example glomerulonephritis patients they have to take 2.5 mg of isolone and i have operated on few patients of glomerulonephritis the patients did absolutely like any other patient now in case the patient has got ankylosing spondylitis uh, if it is involving or any other inflammatory joint disease we make sense that we offer them a hip replacement now patients with significant fai like this patient uh, this was a young lady and as you can see the fai here is very significant though she has got avn the fai is the one where the there is hardly any cartilage remaining here so even if the sphericity of the head is maintained unless we are able to uh, do something for the fai uh, the patient will not really benefit now i have had one more patient who's nearly completed 2 years of uh, avn therapy he gets pain on abduction and cross legged sitting which is a classical feature of a fai uh, and whenever uh, i internal rotate his hip he gets a severe catch into his groin Uh, i am planning to do an arthroscopic excision of uh, the the cam lesion and i don't know how the result will be but i think we will be planning it in the future his uh, head is spherical and maintained so it will be a very interesting uh, thing to see if he gets a relief of symptoms uh, from the fai this is a post cycling uh, avn and uh, because of the nature of the disease as you can see that the this is more than 2 years follow up actually and the head sphericity is maintained but there is uh, the problem here is that there is arthrofibrosis so though she is able to do all her normal activities walking is painless but her range of motion of the hip is severely restricted and uh, though and she is i think around 24 25 and i have already told her that the only way to get range of motion is probably by doing a total hip replacement but she is saying that right now she is happy with whatever hip she has and we are just observing her so this was my short presentation uh, about uh, when not to do alco and uh, if dr rajkumar permits we can take some uh, questions on that sure sir the, thank you for your uh, very lucid presentation dr gaurish as usual and now the thank paper you, is open for discussion and uh, i'll invite questions from the other panelists on this uh, forum sir may i ask question sure sir sure gori sure. sir the lady you talked about who show who had medial lesion only medial lesion for the past 2 years does she have yeah. any symptoms any there is there's any restriction of movements and if so how to manage that and how to treat uh, those symptoms i mean pain killers or yeah so see she gets occasional pain in the hip and that is managed by nsaids uh so and these are basically small episodes uh where she gets occasional pain in the hip and again it settles down so i would label it like uh, you know like osteoarthritis flare up or something like that where the patient has to take some nsaids for a few days but the range of motion of the hip is absolutely normal uh she doesn't have any restriction of all any of her activities of daily living and she's able to do almost everything so the, uh, this is actually that's the reason why there is no need to do anything okay yeah i think uh, 
that was a wonderful presentation gaurish i think uh, thank you sir. i, I think i have heard a couple of times your uh, talk um every time i learn new things from you um you, i just wanted to know do you ever to core pure uh, core decompression or uh, symptomatic uh sir i have i have worked with david hungerford who yeah. was the person uh, who introduced core decompression in english literature now when i worked with him in 2007 uh, for all hips which were more than 30% involved uh, he was doing total hip replacement uh, i spoke to him about uh, doing core decompression and he was absolutely convinced that core decompression does not work in those patients who are in need of it it is an excellent uh, treatment for those patients who do not need it so for those lesions which are medial or they are at very low chance of collapse uh, it would uh, be a cure for them but uh, for those people who have large lesions subchondral lesions uh, typically because there is no biological uh, augmentation involved uh, core decompression does not work now again i would say that uh, why does alco work you know that is that is one thing that we are all uh, try to find out and the way i think that the reason why it works i think is that these osteoblastic cells and i have got a couple of images which i will show you later where the osteoblastic cell are capable of forming new bone very rapidly so when we are curating out uh, the bone from the femoral head and we are replacing it with osteoblastic cells uh the new bone formation is very rapid and that supports the subchondral bone and prevents it from collapse uh there is we cannot really uh, remove all the uh you lost the connection again i think it's absolutely right in saying that uh, codes core decompression alone probably will not uh, help in these uh, patients and uh, uh, as i said in my talk initially we extended um uh, oscro for people beyond the um, stages and those are the patients coming back now uh, for uh, i mean symptomatic and uh, probably some of them have done uh, total hip replacement so i think it's a uh, good lesson from those patients uh, who did not uh, get benefited from oscro um so it is important that uh, we select our patients um and select the lesion especially um i think my talk was again when not to do when to do and when uh, um to wait so i think it's important because uh, otherwise you get bad results if you press you and do not understand the disease problem i agree with you dr d and uh, uh, gaurav as usual will give us new insights on every presentation that he makes and it's important for all the viewers who are uh, who have witnessed uh, a presentation by dr gaurav that we need to be very methodical and uh, very choosy in how we do our procedure especially if you want to do anything biological because to convince a patient for a biological procedure itself is a big uh, humongous task and then we say when we preserve the joint we need to be very uh, choosy and uh, correct in our decision making and that comes from experience and uh, learning over a period of time and i think uh, with gaurish now back and uh, if we can ask you some questions we had lost you for a couple of minutes is that okay doctor you are you are muted uh, gaurish i think you can unmute yourself thank you sir yeah you... i was uh, in your reaction i was uh, saying because i think some uh, i've seen quite a few cases where people just uh, did a core decompression they progress rapidly and need a replacement so they have to understand the pathology how it uh, behaves um so it's important that they identify the right uh, indication and some of my patients initially i was i think with uh, 
extended my indication to oh, a little collapse or maybe more than 50% uh, of the head involvement. And they came back and a few of them, I did a total, total hip replacement. I, I feel personally, sir, that the, the uh, fault lies in the thinking that core decompression gets uh, new vascularity in the femoral head. Now, all of us have done the procedure and when we cure it, all of us can see that there is, because of the bleeding, that there is no lack of vascularity in that area. So the blood is already there. Uh, the problem is that a uh, lot of people, uh, they will drill the subchondral bone uh, to get the vascularity into the subchondral bone and end up damaging the subchondral bone. So that is what I think uh, causes rapid collapse of the femoral head. Uh, so if at all core decompression is what somebody likes, then I think they should stay away from the subchondral bone, which like I said, it is like an end organ almost. And it is difficult to replicate it because it's, uh, the, it, is, it is in that position after a lifetime of uh, bearing stresses of the body. So it cannot be replaced. And even if, uh, it, if, even if new bone is formed there, it will never be strong enough to take the body's weight. Question is open now for the all the panelists. Um, we know that idiopathic um, cause for AVN is uh, maximum, whereas the rest of other causes will fall in the minimal category. Out of that, if you have to pick in causes like SLE, thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, as uh, Dr. Gaurish was mentioning, how confidently we can you know tell them that yes, Osgro will give you a relief or will give you some improvement in the stage of AVN that you are, or should we hold back such a treatment for those, these kind of disease process? Can I answer? Yes, yes, sir. Please. Yeah. So uh, again, the, the whole problem is I had a patient of sickle cell anemia and uh, the sickle cell anemia patient went ahead and got a transplant. Now he is nearly four years post uh, Osgro. He is doing fantastically well. Not only he got Osgro for his shoulders, both shoulders, but both hips as well. Uh, however, bone marrow transplant per se cost, at least in Bombay, it costs 17 lakh rupees. So it's a very expensive treatment. Uh, it is not uh, everybody can get a bone marrow transplant. And obviously it's a very procedure of very high morbidity where they talk about, uh, sorry, mortality. Uh, they cost about around 10% mortality of the patient in bone marrow transplant. Morbidity is a completely different uh, year. So in sickle cell, we can, uh, we can pick and choose. But the problem with sickle cell is always that the hip becomes so painful uh, after a sickling AVN that the patient finds it very difficult to mobilize the hip. And that leads to arthrofibrosis. It not only leads to arthrofibrosis in the hips, but in the shoulders, in the knee, wherever there is AVN, there is a significant arthrofibrosis, which is present, which is extra articular as well as intra articular. So that is the main problem with uh, this thing. Second is, uh, in like I said, if the patient is on a low dose steroid, uh, I have not seen that it has really impacted this treatment. So low dose steroid appears to be a relatively safe way of, you know, of doing these surgeries. However, if the patient is on high dose steroids and if the patient is on cytotoxic drugs, uh, then I think again, uh, I'm, I feel that I'll be very reluctant to do this. I, I think agree. I will agree with uh, Gaurish. I think it's uh, it's very. Um, I think he said everything very clear, and uh, that's what uh, I do. I fully agree with him. Whatever he said. Because I see in our know, clinical practice, these kind of patients who come with SLE, and they are not a happy lot of patients when you try to do Osgro for them. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, whenever they come for follow up, we are of the opinion we feel that I have high fear. So it is like that. They are not a happy yeah. lot at all. So should we really offer SLE patients uh, Osgro 
or not yeah. is now thought process that is going on wherein we have to just wait and do some other yeah things. sir i sir i feel that what you said is a very very correct clinical uh, picture then there is a, a lot of studies also on this that sle as well as rheumatoid arthritis not only does it affects uh, the patient's body but there is a, a uh, patients are depressed and uh, offering uh, such a long term therapy where the results are they take some time to come uh, will be i think difficult advantage of offering total hip replacement in these patients are that they are not very highly mobile patients nor are they likely to be doing a very high impact activities where you know even see ra in a severely or even jra patients where the joint is destroyed at the age of 22 routinely uh, total hip replacement is done and such total hip replacement they last for a long time the reason why they last for a long time is simple because these patients they just want to go around the house in a pain free manner they will do some shopping and you know their activities of daily living is completely different while an active person let's say even up to 40 years of age suffering from av and he is normal in mind and body in all other respects so that is the reason i feel that there is a big difference uh in about uh, sle and rheumatoid arthritis where i think uh, this may not be the correct procedure like you very rightly pointed out sir because uh, i i happen to manage a lady with bilateral avn with sle who is an engineer by profession and uh, she was not a happy lot at all over two years of follow up then finally we had to offer her uh, Uh, total lip for the right side which was looking uh, congruent mostly on the x-ray but she kept on complaining of pain on the right hip now what we have done is we have done total lip and we have sent the head for biopsy we are waiting for the Very pathologist nice. to tell us whether what uh, we have done is genuine procedure or it, it did really help her or a patient conned us by telling the pain was there on the hip more but when you looked at the head on table Uh, it was uh, very spherical not much of soft spot that we see on the head where you can see that it is collapsed so uh, probably in the next couple of meetings when we have the res- results with us i will be able to share with you what happened to that biopsy yeah can i just add it will be very instructive sir yeah, yeah oh, i think about, I, I, as you as you rightly said gorish these patients are low demand <laughs> they will be very happy with the uh, replacements rather than anything else and basic problem here is inflammatory synovial inflammation which is the main part for the pain main component of the pain the head avascular necrosis secondary to synovitis or whatever because of the joint pathology so if we do not deal with the joint itself which is inflammatory process i don't think they will be happy and uh, for them uh, in my opinion the best option would be a replacement rather than anything else because main problem is in the synovium and in the uh, joint itself rajesh your thoughts on the discussion sir? yes please yeah sle sle and uh, such patients or rheumatoid patients who are on uh, steroids and uh, other cytotoxic drugs of course as correct sir rightly mentioned there is no point uh, you know who are on heavy doses there is no point in offering them osgro i just wanted to uh, share a case since we are talking about thr So we had this young lad in his 30s who had stage 2a picket all stage 2a on uh, mri <clears throat> we offered him osgro but he somehow went ahead for extra corporeal shock wave therapy and uh, i don't know whether it works or not for the first 20 days he had very good pain relief after 20 days he had such a pain he straight away went ahead with thr so what could have caused that synovia synovitis or like difficult to say i don't know yeah. <laughs> so but i think uh, uh, people do come i think uh, in hyderabad there so many machines big machines they put the, through the machines and they say they treating uh, whatever i mean so shocks and all those thing to generate stem cells but i think uh, 
if patients get better, if they get better anyway, if they get worse, they get worse anyway without this uh, treatment. That's what I believe. It was basically lithotripsy. It was basically the same procedure, extracorporeal shockwave therapy is lithotripsy that yes. they do for renal stones. Correct. I don't know. I don't know how the it works or how it progresses, how the disease progressed, or maybe in just 20 days he had such pain. He went ahead to some other doctor and straight away and gone for THR. I don't know. I don't know. Damage the head, we, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sir Gorik, sir, any idea? No, I have I have done little tips on myself. I know how it feels, but I don't know about the femoral head. I can't think of the reason. So now I was told that Ashish is going to be uh, sir. Uh, uh, just one minute, sir Charun here. There were a lot of questions on the chat box. Kind of chat box. Uh, yeah. Okay. Surgeon has asked some questions. Okay. Um... Ashok Sajnani, okay. To all the panelists, do you give alendronate with your uh, biological treatment? Reddy sir, Gaurish sir, anybody? I do give, yes. For about uh, 18 months. Uh, my idea is that uh, what I do is that uh, in high risk patients, I'm giving teriparatide because that's a proven uh, anabolic thing for osteoblastic cells. Uh, and uh, in these high-risk patients, I've had a very good result with teriparatide. Uh, I'm right now compiling the data uh, of these patients. So I think uh, by the next meeting, I'll be able to share that. Thank you, sir. Second question is, uh, do COVID avian respond in the same way as other etiology of avian. I think we discussed about it. If COVID, uh, uh, post-COVID, the head involvement is uh, significant, we don't, doesn't respond. And most of the time we see post-COVID, it may be combination of COVID as well as um, steroids. The area of involvement is more than uh, usual uh, compared to idiopathic or isolated steroid. So on the whole, the prognosis may not be as good. But if COVID with the limited lesions, um, I, I think they respond the same way like any other uh, uh, etiology. Gaurash, sir, your thoughts? Rajesh, your thoughts? Uh, I'm uh, Personally, I don't think, I don't know whether COVID is responsible for uh, uh, avian or the steroid is responsible for avian because whatever COVID patients I've seen, uh, post-COVID patients I've seen have invariably taken steroids. Uh, there is only one patient who has, out of so many, that he was categorically said that he has not taken steroids. But I feel that steroid and COVID combination is definitely uh, increased the chances of avian. That much I'm sure. And I think there is no response. So obviously, post-COVID patients do not have that long a follow-up because all these patients started coming in uh, after around six to eight months of the first wave. So right now, my oldest patient is around just completing one and a half years or so. But the response is the same. So I don't think that... Uh, uh, I feel it, it will behave like any steroid avia. I also think that COVID, non-COVID uh, doesn't matter as far as the uh, area of involvement is less than 50% and it fits the selection criteria of biological treatment. Okay. Dr. Sopnil Kalanje wants to know what is the lifespan of an osteoblast cell? Anybody on? Arul, you want to answer? No, uh, I want so, to know, see, know what outcome, yeah. No, no, lifespan of oh. osteoblast cell. Listen, that's all the question is. They are your natural cells. So if you are replacing your natural cells, uh, it is that uh, whatever cells are there, osteoblastic cells are there in your body, it has got the same lifespan. As far as uh, transportation and uh, cell viability is concerned, uh, I think I have been assured that it is more than 90% uh, by the time that it reaches our hand. 
Uh, and Dr. Rajkumar, I think I would request you that please also give your opinion also uh, to these questions. Uh, I think that will be also instructive for all of us. Yeah. Um, Ravi Batula, uh, he, he has spoken about uh, two things here. One is, sir, cytokine injection given by one doctor from Bangalore and it is giving good results for AVN and MRI changes also are there. So he wants to know, does it work or does it not work? Number one. Number two, he says, uh, Stemuputics company is launching in ischemia of limb medicine, stem cell therapy. This injection can be used for avian patient since it is a similar pathology. What do you think about L-arginine? So from my end, uh, if I had to say, I don't have any experience of, you know, prescribing any injection called as a cytokine injection or any stem cell therapy that uh, we use for limb ischemia in AVA. About L-arginine, I don't have any experience either. So, my inputs on this would be limited, Mr. Ravi. Anybody else on the panel has this opinion, kindly go ahead and uh, please discuss. I don't have any experience. Uh, if I... Yeah, uh, uh, sir, I will talk. Uh, I stem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sir, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. So I uh, I think Charu will talk about stemputics. But what I feel is that uh, the basic pathology of AVN is misunderstood. I don't think that it is a ischemic pathology. So the whole point of ischemic uh, pathology and trying to restore the blood supply of the ischemic femoral head is not correct. So it is like uh, if you find a dead person on the road, uh, you are assuming that he died by a heart attack. Only thing we can see is the body of the person. So all the cells are dead. So when the femoral head is dead, we are assuming that obviously the dead part will not have any blood. And therefore, we are assuming the ischemic pathology of uh, the avian. Now, as all of us, if you examine the clinical uh, picture of avian, and if anybody has uh, experienced ischemia in the body, you know, that is an event. If heart develops ischemia, it's an event. Brain develops ischemia, it's an event. Finger develops ischemia, it is an event. The body will allow you to know that it is ischemia. All of us know that avian is a silent disease. So if there was an ischemic episode which caused avian, we would definitely know when this ischemic episode happened. There will be severe pain because of bone ischemia. Like it is there in uh, sickle cell disease or it is there in Kaisen's disease where bone ischemia leads to severe, I mean, debilitating pain. But the classical avian uh, of what is steroid or what is alcohol, I don't think it's a ischemic pathology. So there is no point in treating uh, lesion thinking it's a ischemic pathology. Now about L-arginine, if I will just go and then Charul can talk about the company. L-arginine is, I am using it and L-arginine basically is a nitrous oxide uh, generator. So what it does is that it causes uh, dilatation of uh, microvascular circulation and I use it basically in the hope that it increases the uh, blood flow and oxygenation to the uh, osteoblastic cells. So that is the reason why I am using it, not because it will cause the revascularization of the dead femoral bone. Dr. Charul. Yes. Uh, as per my knowledge, I know this Stembutics has developed the stem cell injection for a Burgess disease and Reynolds disease. So, it's not going to be for AVN. So, they're going to use, as per my knowledge, for Burgess disease and uh, arterial and venous disease. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, can we go on for the next uh, talk of how to use Osgro? Demonstration by Dr. Ashish. Uh, Charul? Yeah, uh, Dr. Neeraj, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so, just uh, let... Uh, yeah, give me one second. Yeah. 
Hello everyone, I am Dr. Rashi Sharbat from Jahangir Hospital, Pune. I am privileged to be a part of this master course on osteoblast implantation for AVM. I am extremely privileged to be talking on Ortho TV, a great initiative. I think Regrow Life Sciences, my seniors, Dr. Rajkumar Amravati, Dr. Gaurish Palekar, Dr. Reddy, and Dr. Rajesh. We have successfully treated more than 200 patients with Osgro, and day by day, our confidence and our approach towards the patient is gaining a lot of confidence. We will be showing the way we do implantation of the cultured osteoblast in the following video. Hello friends, so today we are going to talk about avascular necrosis of the femoral head, what to look clinically. So seeing the x-rays here, now you can see this lesion, these are the compression lines and here is the lesion. On the weight bearing area. Now, the most important diagnosis here is done in the T2 weighted image where you can see this double line sign, double line sign, which is only seen in avian hips. So, this is the double line sign. If there is no double line, it can be any other diagnosis, like it can be just an edema, it can be just some osseous bone formation there. T2 is more important. In the T1 images, since there is no extra water, you cannot differentiate between avian or any other diagnosis. So T2 weighted images are the most important for diagnosis and check for the double line sign. The Osgro trolley setup these are the regrowed osgro cells having osteoblast, chondrocytes, chondroblast. These are the mixing units with thrombin and cells and these are the sterile syringes and this is for combining making the cells into a gel form. So this is the typical setup for doing a core decompression with a modified CT based CRM. This is how we start a percutaneous wire which is seen in the CT based image intensive wire. We go in the lesion. These are the typical instruments that are used. This is used for the core decompression and these instruments for removing the lesion. All super sterile and high tech. This is the flower tip reamer. Now the flower tip reamer has reached the lesion and see how systematically the lesion is been tackled. We will also tackle the superior area from the same hole and then we will put the cells of Osgro along with the gel. Mind you that you have to remain subchondral, you cannot go above the head and systematically you should decompress the bad bone. Now this is how we start scooping the lesion taking out the bad bone from all the directions and there are different angle scoops around eight scoops of different angles so we can tackle all the bad bone now see how we are tackling the superior area reaching with various angles is very very important many a times it is seen that you just go in the center area and come out that is not important such a small incision is used 
hardly any bleeding and this is the typical cored out bone then we'll give a nice wash and lavage we suck out the bad bone give a copious lavage so that it is totally decompressed and a good bleeding is a sign of very good decompression this is how the remaining bony pieces are flushed out and see the healthy bleeding this is a very good sign that you have decompressed it very well once the venous decompression is done arteries are going to follow and within a fortnight new blood supply and everything is going to start so very good decompression and in a very very small 2 cm incision all percutaneous now this is time to insert the cells this is the lesion is you can see it's completely scooped out a nice rim of cortical bone is seen and the lesion becomes a big hollow and here are the cells to be inserted and that's how we do it we we'll just push it in slowly under ct guided cm imaging and thrombin with gel is put inside you have to wait for around 8 minutes for the cells to settle and just close it with a single stitch thank you everyone i hope you like the systematic approach that we take most of our cases are in epidural weight bearing partial offloaded day 1 24 hours discharge i again thank ortho tv regro life sciences and my seniors thank you take this opportunity to thank ashish uh, uh, for this wonderful demonstration on behalf of uh, re regrow and os grow i would like to thank ashish once again uh, any useful tips from uh, dr gaurish or dr kj reddy sir or dr rajesh should be useful uh, to practice this clinically dr gaurish sir Uh, i use i don't use the percutaneous technique uh, and uh, second thing i feel that it is important to you know, prevent the backflow of the cells uh, so i block uh, because this whatever uh, volume that we have uh, i think it's very important a lot of times there is a backflow i i don't know how ashish is managing to prevent uh second thing is that uh, again washing out with uh, saline uh, is not something that i do uh, i don't know about it but i feel that the blood which is remaining inside it's a good medium for uh, the cells so i don't think that is uh, something that i do uh, other than that i think it's a it's a new way that ashish is doing it Uh, and uh, should uh, he is an arthroscopic surgeon so he thinks in a way of doing it this and uh, uh, decrease the needed pain post operative pain to the patient and uh, it's very interesting to see his long term results dr rajesh your thoughts on that dr uh, sir i also open it up quite a quite a bit i see the lateral cortex well and uh, i put one spike in front and one spike behind and then take proper entry and and uh, i i do wash i do wash it once or twice with a 10 and 10 cc syringe so because the debris of the bone that we take out with the scoop just to remove those debris that's it not extensive lavage or wash and at the end uh, generally put a, a bone plug to seal off the uh, hole in the cortex otherwise i do. i i do it in the left in the supine position on a fracture table just like we do a core decompression or dhs in standard way and while putting on the, while injecting the cells we generally tilt the table to the opposite side uh, 15 20 degrees as far as we can that's it dr reddy sir you are practicing yeah, i think i yes i do 
open. I mean, it doesn't take a big incision, small incision only. Use bone spikes, see the lateral cortex. I think uh, Gaurish rightly said it's important that uh, we should uh, see the back flow. Uh, because the volume is about 4 ml. 4 ml we are injecting. It's a big cavity also, may not be the right thing to do. Um, I wash out. I pack with uh, the uh, distal part with the uh, adrenaline pack and remove it. And I block the hole with a screw so that I'm more concerned about uh, back flow. I mean, so we inject and everything comes out. That's more important. Until the table, as uh, Prajay said. Uh, we inject uh, in the areas where uh, curated the bone and uh, made the hole. This is a hypothetical question for all the panelists. So imagine you are doing uh, the step one wherein you are passing your guide pin and inadvertently the guide pin violates the cortex, subcontrol bone. Okay. And in your clinical practice, um, you go ahead and then do all the procedure that you're doing, uh, osteo and everything. And do these patients perform differently than the patients where the subchondral bone is not violated by the guide pin? So guide pin is very small, uh, of a very small diameter. If if by inadvertently guide pin does pass your subchondral bone, you just pull it out a bit and take care that the remer doesn't go to that area. Go to, the remer doesn't penetrate the subchondral bone. Rest, uh, the rest assured, the, uh, the injection is in gel form. It is along with fibrin. So as long as the, your spinal needle doesn't penetrate right through the subchondral bone into the uh, you know, acetabulum, so you can rest be assured that the cells will remain in the part that you wanted what them to be. Yeah, I think uh, sometimes what happens, we don't put, I mean, I don't put personally my, my assistant, some of them will be using, I'm starting off the case. So it did happen to me. And what I did was uh, I redirected, I changed the guide in position to a little different position. Um, and of course, did uh, the breathing and everything and try to whatever uh, little uh, bone or impaction, I try to impact that area because we, I don't know, to be honest, even if it's my minor role, if it leaks into the joint, probably it may not be a nice thing. So changing the guide direction, try to probably impact some bone into that uh, part might help. Go ahead, sir. I have like, like Dr. Eddie said, that this is not hypothetical for me. And in one case, what happened was that there was a bone in the reamer and because of the bone in the reamer, the guide wire was jammed into the reamer and when I was drilling, it penetrated into the joint. Now, every time I'm uh, doing the reaming, proximal reaming, I'm collecting bone from the outer cortex. And uh, like I mentioned in Goa, what I do is that I will, uh, if you collect all that bone, which is not avascular bone, but in the first around four to five centimeter bone of the proximal femur, and you take it separately, uh, you cut a two cc syringe, and you cut off the head, you put everything into the two cc syringe, and then you put push the plunger, you get a nice bone plug. It exactly fits into the 8 mm drill hole. Normally, I use this uh, in the outermost cortex to allow faster healing of the outermost cortex uh, and prevent backflow also. But in this case, what I did was I pushed it all the way inside because I was worried that the cells will not get really because uh, what happens when we are injecting these cells, it is like a we are pressurizing the cells. So these cells are going not only in the cavity, but probably into the other parts of the bone also and spreading there. Now, if there is a leakage because of the guide pin hole, then that kind of tamponade effect will also not be there. So that's the reason why I packed it all the way up to the subchondral EA with a blunt EA. And then there was no difference in the result actually of the patient. So why I asked this question was, uh, as Dr. Reddy rightly put it, yeah, it is usually our uh, uh, juniors or our assistants who start the case to pass the guide pin just to have a hang of how to do a uh, procedure. 
but having uh, rightly said from two experts saying that yes you go in and pack the area where you cause the rent because we want all that you are injecting to be inside the joint uh, inside the head of the femur not uh, you know some percolating into the joint so we need to be very you know having a series wherein where all the uh, patients where we, the head was violated by the guide pin how they are performed so that would be a nice thing to know if uh, they are performed differently or if it is okay to percolate <laughs> the head uh, that was the thing here and now for the final talk of the session if i can invite dr palikar to give us out of his vast experience how the outcome of each patient or how the outcome longest outcome was and how they performed differently after ospro the long term studies by dr palikar please Actually, I will just uh, uh, go through this very fast. Uh, unfortunately, I have uh, today's post-op patients to visit, so if I will be very brief with this, if you allow me, sir. No problem. Uh, yeah. So. I think we've already said this that uh, disease burden is basically. I feel that it is a known thing that uh, more than seventy percent of these patients uh, would require a THR within two to three years of diagnosis. And if we have increased the lifespan of this, uh, yeah, I think we made a significant contribution to preventing a total hip replacement. Uh, one thing that. Uh, all of us when we are dealing with avian we should look for is that uh, this is a very classical case very early avian 2a left side 2b but whenever you are looking at this we should see what is it is and what grade it is so staging is ficat and arlet and grading is obviously by the arco classification so we need to know how high grade what are the chances of collapse of this head this has already been discussed and this is the the slide that i wanted to show you that the spillover cells are forming bone in a uh, outside the canal so this is very instructive for me that uh, uh, you know that the capability of forming uh, bone uh, into even muscle uh, these osteoblasts are very biologically active now this is a eight year result of a patient that i had done very initially at the stage the patient is absolutely normal you can see the x rays these are nearly eight years old x ray uh, though you can see evidence that uh, there will still be uh, evidence of lysis or whatever uh, yeah. but the patient has not collapsed she has got full range of motion uh and basically uh, her, all her problems with respect to avians are over so this is a bilateral avian thankfully we were able to get into her when which was at a uh, stage 2a or uh, stage 2 now arco where there was no collapse and uh, the avian was more than 50% this is a case that i have uh, put here to show how avian behaves because this is one of my longest follow up the surgery was done nearly 11 years ago she is a 27 year old female took uh, cox steroid for cox and it was a bilateral grade 2b avian so bilateral collapse was there and this were her hips now as you can see initially the x ray doesn't look so good uh, this is at 22 months post op and now i have got a series of x rays to show you and how the remodeling of the femoral head has happened this is at 24 months you can see that there is a bone formation into the area or the cavity that we have curated out and this is uh, at nearly 5 years post op the head is still congruous the joint space is maintained uh, and the last time she visited me this was her result at 10 years absolutely normal range of motion this time she was married and did not want an x ray uh but 
on examination, I could not make out that she has ever had AVN. It will be very nice to get her X-ray done uh, whenever she comes next time. But what has happened over a period of time is that the femoral head has remodeled. Uh, something like what happens in Perthes. And it is right now, it is a fairly congruous hip. So her range of motion is good. And definitely she is not uh, very keen on getting a hip replacement done because all her needs are served by this hip. So we have definitely managed to avoid a hip replacement and give a normal function at 10 years. This lady recently visited me again. Uh, this was her eight years. Uh, yeah, and uh, next time I will put her results at again at 10 years. Absolutely normal function. She had pain in her ankle. That's why she visited me. And I took the opportunity of x-raying her hips. Uh, her uh, hips are absolutely spherical and concentric. This is again a 10-year post-operative result. Uh, this guy, if I remember, was on low-dose steroids. And uh, at 10 years, you can see that the relative sphericity of the head and the joint space is maintained. Though you may see some uh, evidence of ABN into the femoral head, which is almost like a scar. And it is the same, I feel like it's like a scar on the skin. So therefore, there is a scar on the femoral head. But uh, I don't think that this uh, patient will deteriorate further. Uh, he's able to do almost all activities that uh, is required. Uh, this guy is a bodybuilder and uh, he routinely lifts uh, and does squats of more than 150 kgs. That's what he tells me. He is four years post-operatively, both hips operated. The right hip was at a stage 2A region or uh, stage 2 uh, where it is concentric, round, absolutely okay. And the left hip is uh, was 2B where again, uh, he's, uh, as you can see, there is some evidence of uh, slight lateral osteophyte where there was initially collapse, but at four years, the patient is doing very well. Finally, this guy is one of the most recent uh, follow-ups. Again, left and right hips, more than 50% involvement, absolutely normal range of motion. Uh, his left uh, right side has got some symptoms. And as you can see, there is a significant uh, cam lesion there. And this is FAI, which I confirmed was there even before uh, the preoperative picture. So this is, nobody can say that this is an osteophyte which is developed because of uh, arthritis. And uh, the patient is asymptomatic except for, uh, you know, uh, extreme abduction is painful for him. Uh, so these are all the cases that I have uh, tried to show you. And the take home message is that in these young people, I think hip preservation is a necessity and everybody deserves a chance uh, especially if he's young and if he's in that uh, stage of the hip where uh, bone preservation is possible. And autologous cultural osteoblast, uh, though it may be a new technique for a few of you, uh, there are fairly long-term results available uh, now of more than a decade, uh, which shows that this, is, uh, this, is, this thing is there for stay right now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gaurash, for your uh, results. And it is really encouraging uh, for all those who want to practice, you know, autologous cultured osteoblasts for managing AVN in clearly indicated cases. I really congratulate you for your uh, research and your wonderful follow-up of these patients. Because if you don't have follow-up of our patients, we are left with, you know, we fall short of, you know, trying to do the next best thing for such a patient. So I really appreciate that you have got long-term follow-up of such patients who may have uh, done autologous uh, cultured osteoblast. And on behalf of uh, Regro and Osgro, I congratulate you once again for your wonderful work and uh, we wish you a happy holidays too. But uh, before you go, if there are any questions from other panelists for Dr. Palekar, sir. Any questions? It's wonderful from work. Uh, yes. Gaurash, I think that's wonderful. I think it's important to have good follow-up uh, of the patient. Then only we know what we're doing and we can give a clear message to the, uh, our colleagues and uh, upcoming surgeons. 
wonderful work you're doing. Thank you. Sir. Have a great holiday. Dr. Rajesh, Thank you, your sir. thoughts? Uh, amazing, amazing follow-up, sir. Congrats. Okay, here I would like to uh, just mention anecdotally, you know, uh, all of us know that there is a race called as a tortoise and a hare. The end of the message by any teachers whom have told us was, you know, slow and steady wins the race. Everybody has heard this, I am sure. But in addition to being slow and steady, I think the tortoise was more patient also. Like Dr. Palekar to wait for 10 years to get these wonderful results. I congratulate you once again and have a happy holiday. Over to you, Dr. Charul, to add a few notes from your end. No, I, I just want to say uh, thank you to... Dr. Rajkumar, if, if it is possible, I would just like to leave the meeting. Uh, I've got an early morning flight and uh, leave the patients today. Thank you, sir. Thank you for sharing yes, your uh, thoughts and uh, we will allow you to... Uh, leave the meeting, sir, and have a great holiday with your family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, and thank you, Dr. Reddy. Uh, thank All you, the Thank you. Yes, Charul. Closing remarks yeah. by you and Dr. Yeah, yeah. Rajesh. Yeah. yeah. I'm thankful to all the panelists, and especially Dr. K.J. Reddy, sir, Dr. Gaurish Palekar, sir, Dr. Rajkumar, sir, and uh, Dr. Uh, Rajit sir and Dr. Ashish sir. And thank you to uh, also TV, uh, Dr. Neeraj sir. So thank you for a wonderful session. It was very informative. Sir. So over to you, Dr. Uh, Rajkumar sir. Thank you once again uh, for all the panelists, Dr. Reddy sir and uh, Dr. Rajesh. And uh, thank you for the opportunity given by the Ortho TV as well as uh, the Regrow Sciences for. Uh, bringing out this experience of managing an avian, which is a difficult problem uh, to treat biologically. And I'm sure uh, there will be keen audience who have listened to the master talks. We'll try to hone their skills and uh, practice this uh, effectively uh, in their day-to-day -day practice. Thank you so much and have a good night. God bless you all. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Good, good, good night. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Bye. Thank Bye. you, sir. Bye.